Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends, I welcome you all to the 17th lecture of our course ADR and Arbitration. We have completed our discussion on part 1 of Arbitration Conciliation Act. There is one more part, a newly introduced part, part 1A. I refer to the provisions of part 1A while discussing section 11. But let me tell you that the new section 11 has not been notified yet. The new part 1A which provides for constitution of Arbitration Council of India that has also not been notified so far. So we did not have a full session on part 1A but I mentioned some of the aspects of part 1A while discussing section 11. Now you all are requested to go through the provisions. These are simple provisions. These are self-explanatory provisions. That's all we had in part one. We finished it in the last lecture. And now I will devote the present lecture on part two of the Arbitration Conciliation Act. Part two of the Arbitration Conciliation Act is for enforcement of certain foreign awards. So that means it is a closed part in the sense that it only talks about enforcement of certain foreign awards. And what are those certain foreign awards? These are New York Convention Awards and Geneva Convention Awards. So therefore, part two does not concern about enforcement of non-convention awards. Non-convention awards may be those awards which are passed in a country which is neither a member of New York Convention nor a member of Geneva Convention. Such an award which is passed in a country which is not a member of either of these conventions is called as non-convention award and part 2 of our act is not concerned with that. There are two definitions of foreign award in part 2. One you find in section 44, the other you find in section 53. But let me tell you, prior to enactment of Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, the aspect of foreign award was covered in two acts. One was Arbitration Protocol and Convention Act 1937. If you recall, I mentioned these laws in our initial lectures. The Arbitration Protocol and Convention Act 1937 was made so as to include the provisions of the Geneva Protocol of 1923 and Geneva Convention of 1927 in Indian law. That was the first international document in relation to enforcement of foreign awards. So these two international documents were enacted in the form of the Arbitration Protocol and Convention Act 1937 and that was for enforcement of Geneva Convention awards. The other international Convention was New York Convention of 1958 and the New York Convention of 1958 was incorporated in the 1961 Act called as the Foreign Awards Recognition and Enforcement Act 1961. So prior to enactment of Arbitration Conciliation Act, foreign awards were governed by these two legislations, one of 1937, the other of 1961. What we have done in part 2 of our act is there are two chapters. Chapter 1 that is from section 44 to section 52. Chapter 1 of part 2 re-enacts the 1961 act. Chapter 1 of part 2 re-enacts the 1961 act. The 1961 act was for the purpose of New York Convention. And chapter 2 of the of part 2 of your act re-enacts the 1937 act. 
So therefore, what you have in part 2, you have two chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 1 consists of sections 44 to 52. It relates to enforcement of New York Convention Awards. Chapter 2 consists of sections 53 to 60. It relates to enforcement of Geneva Convention Awards. And that is the reason why I said that part 2 is a closed part because it relates to only these two foreign awards. It has nothing to do with non-convention award. There are fundamental differences between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Section 44 defines New York Convention Award. Section 53 defines Geneva Convention Award. There are two important differences. One is a New York Convention Award is a New York Convention Award if it is passed in one of the New York Convention countries. Whereas in case of Geneva Convention Award, in addition to the fact that it must be passed in one of the Geneva Convention countries, there is an additional requirement that one of the parties must be from a Geneva Convention country. So nature of party is also important when it comes to definition of Section 53, Geneva Convention Awards. Whereas New York Convention Award is a simple definition, it is New York Convention Award if it is passed in one of the New York Convention countries. The definition initially was not clear because there was a case decided called as NTPC versus Singer and Company in which the Supreme Court said that a foreign award is a foreign award by virtue of application of foreign law. Subsequently, Delhi High Court requested the parliament to clarify the situation. Now it is clear that Indian law is tagged to territory. The definitions are territory specific definitions. A foreign award is a foreign award because it is passed in a foreign territory and not because of application of foreign law. Let it be very clear. So first difference between chapter 1 and chapter 2, section 44 and section 53 is that a New York Convention Award is defined only by virtue of place where it is passed whereas in Geneva Convention Award in addition to the requirement of place where it is passed, one of the parties to the dispute must be from a Geneva Convention country. The second difference is in terms of sections 48 and 57. 48 gives me grounds for opposing enforcement of New York Convention Award. 57 gives me grounds for opposing enforcement of Geneva Convention Award. Now, the difference lies in respect of power of the court. If you prove existence of grounds of section 48, then whether enforcement shall be allowed or not is a matter of discretion of the court. The word used is may. Court may refuse enforcement in case these grounds are established. Whereas there is no such discretion with the court in section 57 in chapter 2 in case of Geneva Convention Awards. Why do we have this discretion? We'll talk about it later on. So these are the two fundamental differences between chapter 1 and chapter 2. In chapter 2, even if you prove existence of one of the grounds which are mentioned in section 48 for opposing enforcement of a foreign award, still whether it will be enforced or not shall be the discretion of the court, which is not the case in Chapter 2 in relation to Geneva Convention Awards. There is an important provision, Section 52, which says that in a situation where both the chapters will apply, in a situation where the award in question qualifies to be called as New York Convention as well as Geneva Convention, in that case, Chapter 1 shall apply it will be considered as New York Convention Award because it is not difficult to understand that New York Convention of 1958 was much advanced international document as compared to Geneva documents. So therefore, in case both the chapters apply, then according to section 52, chapter 1 shall apply in that case. There are two words which we use in the context of foreign awards. One is recognition, the other is enforcement. As we used it in 1961 Act, the Foreign Awards Recognition and Enforcement Act. These are two different concepts. Recognition is a defensive process. It shields any attempt to raise in a fresh proceedings issues that have already been decided in an earlier arbitration. So recognition operates as res judicata. Once 
the force of award is recognized, the same set of issues between same parties cannot be raised again before the tribunal. So, recognition operates as res judicata. Subsequent arbitration is barred by res judicata. The legal force of foreign award is recognized, but it is not enforced yet. Therefore, I said recognition is a defensive process. Whereas, enforcement is a weapon of attack. It is a positive word. It is a more comprehensive concept. And the idea of recognition is very much implied in enforcement. An award is enforced, definitely it is recognized. So, recognition is implied in the term enforcement. We understood it and therefore, when we made our part 2, we did not use the word recognition. We only used enforcement of certain foreign awards. So, I said section 44 defines a foreign award. Section 45 is similar to section 8 of part 1. We have discussed section 8. While discussing section 8, I referred to section 45 if you remember. Power of court to refer the matter for arbitration in case there the matter is covered by arbitration agreement. In case the matter is covered by arbitration agreement, the suit shall not be entertained. The matter shall be referred for arbitration. We have discussed this point in detail. The law relating to section 8 is chlorocontrols. Law relating to section 5 is chlorocontrols. I discussed that case. So, Kanya holding chlorocontrols, if you remember. So, chlorocontrols is the law with respect to 8 and 45 both. Section 45 deals with the power of judicial authority to refer the matter for arbitration if the dispute is covered by an arbitration agreement. If the dispute is covered by arbitration agreement, there shall be no litigation and if a party wants to commit breach of that arbitration agreement and wants to go to court, the court or judicial authority is obliged to refer the matter back to arbitration. That is what we have in section 45. Enforcement of a foreign award in chapter 1 is a three-step process. We will focus on chapter 1, let me tell you. Enforcement of a foreign award is a three-step process. Section 47, 48 and 49. 46 talks about an application to be filed for the purposes of enforcement of a foreign award in India. If you want to enforce your foreign award in India, an application has to be filed. Evidences have to be furnished. Copy of the award, etc. will have to be filed. Section 48 provides grounds on which the opposite party may resist the enforcement, may oppose the enforcement of that foreign award. And section 49 says that an award which passes the test of section 48 becomes decree of the court is executable as such. So, enforcement of a foreign award is a three-step process, 47, 48, 49. File an application, face the opposition raised by the other part in 48 on the grounds mentioned in 48. And 49 says once the award passes the test of 48, it becomes decree of the court. It is as good as decree of a court and it is executable now. Now, there is an important point here. For the purpose of part 2, the word court has been defined separately. I have been referring to the definition of court in section 2e. The definition of court for the purpose of part 2 is that it means high court having jurisdiction. So, principal civil court is not court for the purposes of foreign award. Now, it is relevant to mention here that 2015 amendment has changed the entire scheme of this act in one way. Because prior to 2015, the meaning of court in 2E was that court means principal civil court having jurisdiction, whether it is for the purposes of international commercial arbitration or any domestic arbitration other than international commercial arbitration. So, for all the arbitrations done in India, court used to mean principal civil court having jurisdiction. Wherever the, we use the word court, it means principal civil court having jurisdiction. And foreign award, with respect to foreign award, with respect to foreign seated arbitration, court means high court. So, the classification was between India seated arbitration and foreign arbitration. Now, the classification has changed. Now, the classification is pure domestic arbitration. That is, 
between Indians in India on one hand and ICA done in India and foreign city arbitrations on the other hand. Try and understand. International commercial arbitration which was considered similar to pure domestic arbitration done in India is now considered more like foreign city arbitration. We now want to treat ICA at par with foreign city arbitration. Why do we want to do that? We want to do that to raise the confidence of international trading community in Indian arbitration system. We want to convey this message to the international arbitrating community that India is flexible with respect to international commercial arbitration in the same manner as we are flexible with respect to foreign seated arbitrations. And the rigidity which we have in our law with respect to pure domestic arbitration shall not apply to ICAs done in India or foreign seated arbitration. How are we conveying this message? First, with the help of definition of court. Court means principal civil court only for, for pure domestic arbitration. For ICA done in India or for foreign seated arbitration, court means high court. First point. Second, if you remember, I said in section 29A, there is a timeline mentioned for making of award. But that timeline is only for the purposes of pure domestic arbitration. It is not for the purposes of international commercial arbitration. If you remember, while discussing section 34, I said, there is an additional ground of patent illegality that is available only to set aside the award coming from pure domestic arbitration not from international commercial arbitration. So we are deliberately creating a difference between pure domestic arbitration and ICA, international commercial arbitration done in India. Why are we doing it? Now we want to treat ICA similar to foreign awards. Why, we, why, why are we doing it? Because we want to enhance the confidence of international arbitrating community in our Indian arbitration system. This was an observation which boy, I, I wanted to share. Now, go back to what I was saying. Enforcement is a three-step process, section 47, section 48, 49. In 47, you file the application. In 48, there are grounds on which enforcement of a foreign award will be opposed. What are these grounds? When I'll read these grounds for you, you will find some familiarity with these grounds. Because by and large, these grounds are similar to what we have discussed in section 34. The first ground is incapacity of parties and invalidity of arbitration agreement. If you recall, the first ground there was incapacity of parties. The second ground was invalidity of arbitration agreement. We have clubbed first two grounds of 34 here in 48. So the first ground on which enforcement of a foreign award is opposed is incapacity of parties and invalidity of the arbitration agreement. The second is due process. Due process means two things. First, adequate notice, proper notice of appointment of arbitrator was not given. I have discussed this point. What do we mean by appropriate notice? It has to be very clear. It has to be very real. Sufficient time must be given to the party with the, on the basis of the notice. And if that is not the case, right to be heard is violated. Second aspect of due process requirement is opportunity to present the case. So this is the second ground. Due process not complied with. Third, the award deals with a difference not contemplated by or not falling within the terms of submission agreement. I said this is important. Submission agreement is the key word here. We use the same word there also in 34. Award relates to some subject matter, some difference which was never submitted for arbitration. Award relates to some subject matter which was never referred for arbitration, which was never part of submission agreement. The fourth ground is faulty composition of arbitral tribunal or the faulty procedure followed. Fifth. The award has 
not yet become binding on the parties or has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority of the country in which or under the law of which that award was passed. We will talk about this ground. So, incapacity, invalidity, due process, exceeding jurisdiction, faulty composition, faulty procedure, these are first four grounds and these are similar to first five grounds of section 34. Then you have towards the end, if you see, there are two more grounds. The difference remains the same. The first five grounds have to be pleaded and proved. Last two grounds, court will take cognizance of these grounds on its own. The subject matter of the difference is not capable of settlement by arbitration, non-arbitrability. I spoke about non-arbitrability in the last lecture. The subject matter of difference is not arbitrable under the law of India. And the last, the enforcement of the award would be contrary to the public policy of India. We have discussed the meaning of public policy of India. Public policy of India means the award must, be, must not be obtained by fraud or corruption. The award must not be the result of violation of sections 75 and 81. The award must not violate fundamental policy of Indian law. It must not be against most basic notions of justice and morality. This is the meaning we have now. Patent illegality is not part of the definition of public policy of India. So, these are the grounds on which enforcement of a foreign award may be challenged. I will talk about the fifth ground which I have highlighted here. I will talk about this ground later on because this is the only point on which section 48 differs from section 34. We are familiar with these grounds. First four grounds are same as first five grounds of section 34 and last two grounds here are also same as last two grounds of section 34 except the fifth ground. We will talk about it a bit later. In relation to enforcement of foreign awards, there are few observations. For example, in the case called as Coach Navigation Incorporated, Coach Navigation Incorporated versus Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited, AIR 1989, the Supreme Court held that the foreign award must be executed as it is and there is no scope of any addition to the award. The court can at best interpret the award or construe the award. So, as to understand the proper intent and meaning of that award, but court cannot add something to that award. It is only when the award is ambiguous that court can interpret it, construe it, so as to understand its true intent and meaning. So, therefore, a foreign award has to be enforced as it is and there is no scope for any addition to be made in the foreign award. Point number one. Second observation. Various high courts had different opinion about enforcement of a foreign award which has passed the test of section 48. The question which arose was after passing the test of section 48, once the challenge is turned down by the court, challenge or opposition for enforcement is turned down, rejected by the court. Should we start the proceeding of Order 21 CPC for enforcement of the award? Is there any requirement of initiating an execution proceeding of Order 21? That used to be the question. Different high courts differed. Finally, the matter was settled by the Supreme Court in the case of Fuse Day Lawson Limited versus Jindal Export 2001 Supreme Court. Fures Day Lawson Limited versus Jindal Export, AIR 2001, Supreme Court. Court held that there is no need to take separate proceedings. One for deciding the enforceability of the award and other to take up execution therefore. It is not that in section 48 we are only deciding enforceability. It is self-executable. Once it passes the test of section 48, it becomes executable. There is no need to have a separate execution proceeding. Because if you start a separate execution proceeding under Order 21, that would defeat the purpose of this Act. The purpose of this Act is 
to ensure speedy and effective enforcement of foreign awards. That will be defeated because now you will again start the whole process of Order 21. Therefore, after the judgment of Fuse Day Lawson Limited versus Jindal Export, it is now clarified that you don't require two proceedings. One for deciding enforceability in Section 48 and 49 of Arbitration Conciliation Act, and second, the execution of Order 21. No, that Order 21 proceedings are not required. I said that the difference between Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, the first difference was in terms of meaning of foreign award. The second difference, if you recall, I said, Section 48 uses the word may and not shall. So, unlike 57, 48 uses the word may. What it means is, even if you prove existence of one of the grounds which I discussed in Section 48, invalidity, incapacity, due process, etc. Even if you prove existence of one of the grounds, whether it is to be enforced or not is a matter of discretion of the court. It is a matter of discretion. Court may still allow enforcement even if you prove existence of one of the grounds. Or if you fail to prove existence of one of the grounds, still may court order for non-enforcement of a foreign award. As I said, if you compare the grounds of 48 with grounds of section 34, you will see that first four grounds of 48 are same as first five grounds of section 34. These grounds are procedural in nature. Try and understand, a foreign award has come to India. Why it has come to India? It is passed in some other country. It has come to India for enforcement. Why? Because probably the subject matter of that difference lies in India. So, therefore, it has to be enforced in India. But before it comes for enforcement in India, it can be challenged in the country where it was passed because in the country where it was passed, it is a domestic award. And so, therefore, if the award is passed in England, it will be challenged in England under their section 34 kind of provision. As I said in the last class also, in previous lectures, I said that by and large laws have been harmonized. The laws of arbitration in different countries have been harmonized. The grounds of challenge in section 34 here and the grounds of challenge in section 34 kind of provision in England are by and large the same. Now, there is an award which has passed the test of section 34 kind of provision in England and it comes to India, it is going to be challenged on similar grounds in 48. Why to have these grounds again in section 48? There are authors who say that first four grounds of section 48 may be dropped because these are procedural in nature and these have already been examined. These have already been examined by a competent court in the country where the award is passed. So, you are putting the same award to multiple scrutiny on identical grounds. So, instead of having these many grounds, we can think of dropping first four grounds of section 48.1. This is the opinion of some of the authors. But the fifth ground in section 48 is different. Now, if I go back to the fifth ground, the award has not yet become binding. It has not yet become binding. For example, in Indian context, if you do not sign the award, if the arbitrators do not sign the award, it is not binding on the parties. So, probably something wrong has happened, it has not become binding yet. Now, an award which has not become binding, how can you enforce that award in India if it is not binding? Or it has been set aside by a competent authority there. If the award is passed in England, probably it is set aside by a court in England. If it is set aside, it does not exist or if it is suspended by a competent authority of that country, of that country where the award was made. So, if the award was passed in England, a court in England must have suspended that award or must have set aside that award. I just said that word may has been used in section 48, even if you prove one of these grounds enforcement or no enforcement is a matter of discretion with the court. 
बट दिस मे शैल मीन शैल माइंड दिस मे शैल मीन शैल विद रेस्पेक्ट टू दिस फिफ्थ ग्राउंड फोर्टी एट वन ई बिकॉज देर इज नो स्पेस टू टॉक अबाउट डिस्क्रिप्शन हेयर दिस इज एज गुड एज देर इज नो अवॉर्ड and if there is no award what will be enforced so with respect to this ground may means what shall there is no discretion here if you prove existence of this ground then court is bound to reject enforcement of such a foreign award i hope you understand this point so i said first four grounds here are same as first five grounds of section 34 the fifth ground here is different it says in case the award is either not binding or suspended or set aside then in that case such an award cannot be enforced in india if it has been set aside by a competent authority of the country where the award is passed how can you enforce it in india so 481e provides for something which actually happens in 34 what happens in 34 setting aside So 481e talks about something which actually happens in 34 kind of provision. So this is about the provision. I said I will be focusing on chapter one of part two. So this is about the provisions. We understand what is there in 45, 47, 48, 49. It is enforceable now. What are the grounds? There is another important point with respect to foreign seated arbitration. This is applicability of part one of the act to foreign seated arbitration. whether part 1 of the act applies to an arbitration which is done outside india this question came in the case of bhatia international versus bulk trading sa and other air 2002 whether part 1 of the act applies to a foreign seated arbitration and court in this case said yes part 1 applies there are grounds on which court came to this conclusion for example if you read section 2 sub section 2 2 2 it says this part shall apply where the place of arbitration is in india 2 2 falls in part 1 it says this part shall apply where the place of arbitration is in india court concluded that 2 2 does not say that this part shall not apply where the place is not in india so on that basis court concludes that part 1 shall apply to foreign seated arbitrations many grounds were there court said that if you do not allow and listen to me carefully if you do not allow part 1 to be applied to foreign seated award arbitrations how will you enforce non convention country award part 2 is good only for convention country awards new york convention awards geneva convention awards that's it close chapter if you allow part 1 to be applied to foreign seated arbitration what will happen the meaning of domestic award which you have in section 27 the meaning of domestic award is not territory tagged mind domestic award means an award passed under part 1 that's it it does not say an award passed in india is domestic award so supreme court in bhatia international versus bulk trading said that there is no requirement that the award must be passed in india to be called as domestic award therefore even those awards which are passed in non convention country even those awards may be called as domestic awards if the arbitration is done according to part 1 that is possible only when you extend part 1 to foreign seated arbitrations so in order to ensure that non convention country awards are also enforced you will have to extend application of part 1 to foreign seated arbitrations and there is no prohibition 2 2 nowhere says that this part does not apply when the arbitration takes place outside india it only says this will apply when it takes place in india court also says suppose there is a situation where two parties are doing arbitration outside india and the subject matter lies in india 
in case one party wants to dispose of the subject matter, where will you go and claim relief? The arbitration is being done outside India. The subject matter lies in India and one party is trying to dispose of the subject matter to defeat the possibility of enforcement of award. Now you want to stop him from alienating the subject matter, from disposing of the subject matter, where will you file the application? You will have to file the application in, in, in the concerned court under section 9 in India. If you do not allow part 1 to be applied to foreign seated arbitration, if you do not allow section 9 to be applied, then the party will remain remediless for all times to come because there is no mechanism to stop me from disposing of the subject matter and tomorrow even if you win the case, you have nothing to enforce the award. So these are some of the regions, some of the grounds on which Supreme Court in Bhatia International case says that part 1 applies to foreign state arbitration. Part 1 applies to foreign state arbitration. The entire part 1 shall apply. If parties do not exclude application of provisions of part 1, entire part 1 shall apply to foreign state arbitration. Then something very strange happened in the context of Indian law. There is a case called as Venture Global Engineering versus Satyam Computer Service Limited and another. This is 2008. There is a foreign award. Listen to me carefully. There is a foreign award which is passed in a foreign country. Ideally, it should come to India for enforcement and should be challenged in section 48. It's a foreign award. A New York Convention award should ideally come in India for enforcement in part 2, chapter 1 and should be opposed in section 48. The party which wanted to oppose the enforcement realized that patent illegality is not a ground in section 48. Whereas it is a ground in section 34. If we can challenge it in 34, we will be successful in challenging it on the ground of patent illegality. Bhatia International has already said, the case of Bhatia International Supreme Court has already said that part 1, the whole of it applies to foreign seated arbitration. If the whole of it applies to foreign seated arbitration, section 34 of the act should also apply to a foreign award. And therefore, the party, instead of opposing enforcement in 48, challenged that award in section 34 in the case called as Venture Global versus Satyam Computer. This was a strange thing, nowhere happened. You cannot challenge a foreign award and get it set aside. If at all it has to be challenged, it must be challenged in section 34. But because, according to Supreme Court in Bhatia International, part 1 applies to foreign state arbitration, including 34. So, that party filed as an application in section 34 and the award was set aside by the court on the ground of patent illegality. This was criticized that there is some problem in interpretation of law. When you extend the application of part 1 to foreign state arbitration, strange results as we saw in Venture Global will take place. So, something needs to be corrected. It is the combined effect of ONGC and Bhatia International which led to the case of Venture Global, where a foreign award was challenged in section 34, a foreign award was set aside in section 34. So the problem was cured and in Bharat Aluminium Company case, in Balco case, Supreme Court clarified that part 1 and part 2 are mutually exclusive parts. And part 1 of the act does not apply to foreign seated arbitration. Therefore, Bhatia International judgment was overruled. It was argued that 2.2 2 does not say that this part shall not apply. That was not accepted. It was argued that how will you enforce non-convention country awards? Supreme Court said that. If law does not provide for enforcement of non-convention country awards, it is not the responsibility of court. 
if at all it is a lacuna, let it be corrected by the parliament. Section 45 says, Section 54 says, notwithstanding anything contained in part 1, listen to me carefully. Section 45 starts with the non obstant clause, notwithstanding anything contained in part 1. Section 54 also starts with a non obstant clause, notwithstanding anything contained in part 1, if there is no relationship. Why should we have non obstant clause? This was the argument. Court says that non obstant clause does not establish relationship. It establishes no relationship. It was also argued that if you do not allow application of part 1 to foreign state arbitration, section 9 will not apply. In that case, what will happen if the arbitration taking place outside India? Subject matter lies in India, one of the party is about to dispose of the subject matter. You want to stop him, where will you go? You are bound to use section 9. If you do not allow section 9 to be used in the context of foreign awards, one party may remain remediless for all times to come. Court categorically dismissed this argument saying that if you have chosen Indian law, you have chosen it with its limitations. You knew that part 1 shall not apply. 2.2 two is very much there. And if you think that a party will remain remediless, in that case, this is again a lacuna to be corrected by the parliament. So therefore, what happened from Bhatia International to Balco judgment? What happened in Bhatia International court said that unless parties exclude application of part 1 provisions, the entire part 1 shall be applicable to foreign trade arbitration. Let me clarify it a bit. Supreme Court in Bhatia International said that when you are doing arbitration in India, you have the freedom to exclude only the non-mandatory provisions. But mandatory provisions will apply. When it comes to arbitration situated in foreign country, parties have the freedom to exclude application of mandatory as well as non-mandatory provisions of part 1. But if they do not exclude it, then entire part 1 will apply. As it happened in Venture Global, entire part 1 applied, a foreign award was set aside under part 1 of the act, which was heavily criticized, that was corrected by Balco judgment of 2012 where court clarified that there is no relationship between part 1 and part 2. These are mutually exclusive. And if you think that section 9 must be made available to foreign state arbitration, you request the parliament to do it. It is not the job of the court to correct the lacunas of, of the law. Part 1 of the act shall not apply to foreign state arbitration. In 2015, on the basis of recommendation of Law Commission of India, the parliament amended the law and incorporated a proviso in section 2.2. 2.2 which said that this part shall apply but the place is in India. Now has a proviso. Provided that subject to an agreement to the contrary, the provisions of section 9, 27 and clause A of subsection 1 and subsection 3 of section 37 shall also apply to international commercial arbitration even if the place of arbitration is outside India. So, what has happened in 2015 on the basis of law commission recommendation? Some of the provisions, section 9, section 27, section 37, 3, section 37, 1, A, these four have been given extraterritorial operation. These four will apply even when the place of arbitration is outside India. But this is subject to party autonomy, provided that subject to an agreement to the contrary. It means parties by way of their agreement can say otherwise. Parties can write that we don't want to make these provisions applicable to a foreign state arbitration. That is always possible. 
So subject to party autonomy, these four provisions will apply to arbitrations done outside India. And if you look at these provisions carefully, all these relate to court interference. Section 9, power of court to pass interim measures. Section 27, court assistance in taking evidence. Section 37, appeal related to these provisions. And the provision says it shall apply to what? International commercial arbitration which is done outside India. International commercial arbitration means at least one party has got international character. What if two Indians are doing their arbitration outside India? Do you think that these four provisions will still apply to that arbitration? I will again ask this question. This is for you to think. The four provisions have been given extraterritorial operation in case of an international commercial arbitration done outside India, where one party has got international character. If both the parties are Indians and they do their arbitration in Singapore, which is possible, we have discussed it in section 28, Atlas Industries case. If both the parties are Indians and they do their arbitration in Singapore, do you think that these provisions will still apply because that should not be considered as an international commercial arbitration from my side, my point of view, from Indian law point of view? Does it apply to an arbitration where both the parties are Indians? This is a question for you to think. I am leaving this question for you. So that completes our discussion on applicability of part 1 to foreign seated arbitration. We now understand there are four sections four provisions which will have extraterritorial operation. Although these, nothing was made, given extraterritorial operation by the Supreme Court in Balco judgment, but Parliament made these changes. Now, the last point which I want to discuss is choice of law. If you see in the slide, part 1 has provisions for commencement of arbitration, section 8. We have provision on conduct of arbitration, sections 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 to 26, 22 to 33. We have provision on for challenging the award, section 34. Then you have provision on recognition and enforcement, section 35, section 36. And then you have ancillary provisions 1, 2, 7, 9, 27, 37, 38 to 43. So therefore, part 1 contains provisions for every aspect of arbitration. Commencement, section 8, then you have provisions on conduct of arbitration, provision on challenge to the award, provisions on recognition and enforcement, then you have ancillary provisions. When you come to part 2, you have a provision on commencement, yes, same as this one. Commencement is there in part 1, it is section 8. In part 2, it is section 45. You have provision on recognition and enforcement just like this. You have it here, 46 to 49, chapter 1. You have provisions which relate to ancillary matters just like this. You have these provisions 44, 50 to 52. But you do not have provisions for conduct of arbitration and challenge to the award. This is where you need parties to designate the law. You do not have provisions on conduct of arbitration and challenge to the award. So therefore, you need some law for this purpose in case of foreign seated arbitration. And there lies the point of choice of law, freedom of parties to choose law. And that is what we will discuss now. There are three laws which I will be referring to. One is proper law of contract. The other one is proper law of arbitration agreement. Proper law of contract has to be expressly or impliedly chosen by the parties. If there is express designation, there is no problem. If parties expressly mention that this law shall be our proper law of contract, proper law of contract is the law which regulates the main contract. If it is not there expressly, then we have to gather the intention of the parties. 
and there are factors which we use for gathering the intention of the parties for example convenience and sense to the language selection of court which court has been selected which court has been given jurisdiction whether the selection has been made by the parties whether it has been made by the arbitrators we have to see we have to see the surrounding circumstances the idea is to see as to what parties or what a reasonable man would have decided the place where contract is made the form and object of contract the place of performance of contract the place of residence of parties all these factors will be used to gather the intention of the parties on the basis of construction so if there is an express designation it is fine if it is not there we have to find out the intention of the parties but if no intention can be gathered on the basis of these factors then in that case court will impute an intention and the legal system with which the transaction has its closest and most real connection will become proper law of contract so express choice if it is not there find out the intention of the parties on the basis of these factors even then if we are unable to find out what is the proper law of contract in that case court will impute an intention to the parties and the legal system with which the transaction has its closest and most real connection therefore becomes the proper law of contract coming to proper law of arbitration agreement it has to be chosen by the parties either express or implied if proper law of arbitration agreement is not chosen neither expressly nor impliedly nothing is clear then what shall be the proper law of arbitration agreement there are two situations proper law of arbitration agreement is not chosen but proper law of contract is chosen in that case the proper law of arbitration agreement is same as proper law of contract if none of these are chosen neither proper law of contract is chosen not proper law of arbitration agreement is chosen then in that case proper law of arbitration agreement shall be law of the seat of arbitration law of the country where arbitration is being done the third is proper curial law it has to be chosen expressly there is no implied choice here proper curial law proper law of procedural law has to be chosen expressly and when we choose proper law of of procedure we have to be careful that it must not conflict with public policy of seat it must not conflict with mandatory provisions of law of seat and if there is no choice made then law of seat becomes the proper law of proceedings that is proper curial law there are few things which can be decided on the basis of proper law of arbitration agreement for example validity of agreement validity of notice constitution of tribunal whether award lies within jurisdiction validity of award all these things are to be decided according to the proper law of arbitration agreement whereas these are the aspects which are decided on the basis of with the help of proper curial law procedural law manner in which the reference is to be conducted the powers and duties of arbitrators there is one last point mentioned here enforcement is subsequent to an independent of the proceedings enforcement is therefore governed by proper law of arbitration agreement enforcement is a substantive point it is governed by proper law of arbitration agreement this lecture concludes our discussion on law of arbitration we discussed part 2 as well as the issues of applicability of certain provisions of part 1 to foreign state arbitration the next three lectures shall be on more amicable methods of dispute resolution like conciliation negotiation mediation and other hybrid processes of dispute resolution that's all i had on arbitration thank you very much
many a times we all think who am I, why am I doing whatever I am doing, why do I feel attracted towards others, why do I feel very aggressive in certain instances, why certain people or certain type of acts they repel me. Why is it that I always search for certain things which look very, very ambiguous? These are the things, these are the questions that all of us experience, all human beings. And you would realize that many a times certain domains of knowledge, especially within social sciences and all sciences at large, when you look at it from a philosophical point of view, they would try to give you the answers to these questions. Now, one of the branches of understanding which helps you understand things much better, which also helps you understand not only what is visibly present before you, what is glaringly apparent to you, rather which also uh, know, tells you what is not visible at all, what, what goes within. Okay. And this is the subject knowledge what is called as psychology. It is not only that it helps you understand the manifested behavior, the overt behavior, how you talk, how you speak, how you say it, how you interact, how you respond, not only that, but also what goes within, what makes you do this, what makes you think this way, what makes you act that way. Why is it that certain things you appreciate? certain things you feel attracted towards and why is it that many a times in certain type of situations you feel you should completely go out of it, you should not get any way involved into it, the repulsion. Why is it that certain acts although you do not appreciate still you get involved into it. Then you reinterpret your own behavior and you start giving birth to certain type of experiences, shame, guilt, pleasure, appreciation. You see world in a particular way, you analyze it in a particular way, you derive emotion out of it, feeling out of it and the mix of what you perceived along with what you experience, it makes you act in a particular way, respond in a particular way your response is received by somebody else and then the other person also responds in that situation. Now, there are situations where several people interact simultaneously, the situation remains constant and different people interact at the same time, you realize that your identity gets lost. You are not an individual, you act what is called as group behavior. You realize that you do not have an explanation for either, either favoring somebody or completely being unfavorable to the other person. You later on realize that it was a favorable or an unfavorable attitude towards that individual. You realize that you repeat certain form of behavior. Why? You do not know. People tell you that such type of repetitions are not normal. Human beings largely do not do that. And then you realize that okay, this is a particular pattern of a behavior for which I require the help of a specialist. The specialist tells me that this pattern of behavior is given a particular taxonomy, a particular nomenclature, which is either some aberration in the normal behavior, it is a neurotic form of a behavior, psychotic form of a behavior, it could be a psychosomatic response. And psychology, it covers all of this. So, if you want to understand yourself, if you want to understand others, this is the subject which helps you achieve that target. It is behavioral sciences that makes you understand human beings, human responses, human existence in complete totality.